Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today we're going to deal with a topic that comes up periodically, and that is a snubber. And the name implies that there's really something interesting about these devices, and it came up lately in a comment. So let's go ahead and move on and take a look at what a snubber is. <laughs> Now, before we get started with the subject of snubbers, I want to address a couple of comments in my feedback segment. And it'll be short, so hang in there. Uh, basically, I keep getting questions from people about exactly what's going on with this clock located behind me here. I'm not going to zoom in on it or anything. It's just a standard electric quartz clock with a uh, Southern Railway emblem on the face of it. And people keep asking me, why doesn't it work? And somebody offered to send me a couple of batteries to, to get it running again. That, that clock right there actually is uh, one of several here in the layout room that are fast clocks and are controlled by a fast clock controller device. And I covered how to build this particular uh, fast clock system in my book, uh, Wiring Projects, for your model railroad. So if you really are interested in getting into the nitty gritty of it, that's where it is. So that clock only runs when I turn on the fast clock controller, and it runs a at a ratio of 3 to 1. And eventually, when we get back to operations, I will give you more information on uh, fast clock ratios and why we use them, that kind of thing. So that's my first bit of feedback to you. Now, the other one uh, was a, a question that came up last week, and uh, some individual asked me about snubbers. What is a snubber, and uh, can I talk about snubbers? So I decided to go ahead and do this video on snubbers. So what I want to do today is cover several questions, specifically, um, what is a snubber exactly, and what does it do, how does it do it, how do you know if you need one, and finally, where can you get one, or can you build one, and if you do, where do you put it? Now, actually, snubber is not the proper term for what we use in DCC. Snubbers actually deal with power supply and electromechanical engineering issues, and DCC is a little bit different from that, because the DCC track power bus uh, signal is a combination of both data communications and power. So the device that we use uh, with DCC is more appropriately named an RC filter, or a resistor capacitor filter. And it's called a resistor capacitor filter because that's what goes into them. And if you're really interested in the details of all of this and what I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to ask you to take a look at Mark Gurry's website. And I put a link to his website in the description to this video. So you can go there and click on it, and you can read all of the gory details of how these things work and the, the history of the design and all of that, some of the details that I'm not going to uh, get into here. But Mark Gurry's is the main expert on RC filters and how we use them here uh, in DCC. So what does an RC filter do? And I'm going to stop calling them snubbers at this point and go by the correct name of RC filter. Now, basically, they deal with several different issues uh, that are specific to DCC power buses and the track. And specifically, they deal with voltage spikes. They deal with the electronic noise that occurs on your track due to uh, the arcing at your motor brushes and also at your wheel contacts where the wheels are coming into contact with the rails, you'll see arcing going on, and that causes electro, uh, electronic noise uh, in the system that the decoders have to deal with. They limit the maximum frequency of your DCC signal. They will act to actually preserve the waveform of the DCC signal. And I will show you some uh, oscilloscope uh, displays here in a minute of what the DCC waveform should look like and what can go wrong. So they take care of all of those issues for you and help clean it up. Now, why is that important? Well, the reason is that our decoders in our locomotives look at that waveform, and they use something called edge detection 
uh, techniques in order to decode the signal coming from the command station. And if there's anything odd about those edges and about that DCC signal waveform, the decoder is, has built-in programming that tells it to ignore those. And if it ignores enough of those, then things can start to go wrong on your model railroad with the way that your locomotives respond to your throttle commands and your DCC system. Now I said I would give you the symptoms that you can look for so you can tell whether or not you actually need a RC filter on your model railroad. And those are, and I'm going to put a list of them up here for you to look at here. And number one is the loss of control. So, you know, you might be running along on a portion of your layout and your uh, train stops responding to throttle commands or uh, you can't blow the whistle uh, or ring the bell, things of that nature. That is loss of control. Now, the second thing that can happen is runaways. And that's where the decoder itself gets confused and just puts 14 volts from the track. It, let's assume you've got 14 volts on the track. It's going to give you 14 volts to the motor, and that locomotive is going to take off like a bat out of hell. And that can happen particularly when you have intermittent shorts on the layout, uh, and, and, the lo and the train will just take off uh, as fast as it can go. So that's a pretty disastrous type of thing, and you're definitely going to know when that happens. Uh, you might not know when you lose control because, you know, if a train is going along at a certain speed uh, and it stops ignoring your throttle commands, it's going to continue at the same speed that it was going at previously. It's only when you try to change the speed that you're going to realize that you have no control over it. Now, another thing, the third thing that you can look for is do you have unexplained loss of programming. And that can be two different things. You can have a locomotive that's actually running and the, uh, the memory uh, will get corrupted due to this electronic noise on the track. And all it takes to fix that is to basically tip the locomotive uh, sideways a bit to interrupt power to it and then repower it and it'll run just like it was before. Now the other thing that can happen is, is uh, CVs can actually get changed in the decoder. So you might program in a value of uh, 34 for CV29, and it might get corrupted and end up being a value of 4 or something else. That's just one example. But it can happen to any one of your CV settings uh, as a result primarily of very large voltage spikes. And these occur again uh, primarily when you've got a short on the layout, when you're uh, when you've got a locomotive that uh, crosses a rail gap uh, that is uh, at a turnout that is set against it, things like that. Those little intermittent shorts that are annoying and cause things to stop all of a sudden, but they can also uh, end up changing the programming of your CVs. And then finally, uh, the, the most uh, significant one is you can actually blow your decoder. And I guarantee you, you will notice when that happens because it's going to let the smoke out and it's going to let the smell out and you're going to know that you've got a blown decoder. And that, again, is primarily due to large voltage spikes. And again, when I show you the, uh, the oscilloscope scans, uh, you'll, you'll get a feeling for what I'm talking about as far as voltage spikes go. This is a scan, uh, an oscilloscope scan, taken uh, from a NCE Powerhouse Pro system with the uh, connection being made at the track outputs on the command station booster itself. So you're getting exactly what's coming directly out of the command station booster combination on that NCE system. So you can see here we have our waves, a beautiful square wave that goes up sharply. You've got ripple across the top and then a rapid drop off and then on the other rail you're seeing the same symmetrical wave and then it's present for a, a, a brief time and then another one okay so we've got these nice square waves alternating between different rails which is the way that DCC power works as I've told you in the past now you can see here the peak to peak and that's what this is here from one peak to the other peak on the two different rails uh, is running at 28.8 volts. So that's an on-track power of about 14.4 volts. 
So we're, we're seeing a very nice, well-behaved system, very clean, right out of the command station. Now, as I said earlier, some of the things that can happen is due to electrical noise from the rails and properties of inductance, which is the interaction between the wires and the DCC signal like this, um, you can get various things happening. You can get these edges being rounded off on each end here. And after a while, if you accumulate a lot of these things, then the decoder will begin to ignore some of these uh, commands, some of these signals that make up your DCC commands. And that's when you lose control. And then there's other things that can happen. But what's most important here is we're seeing something on the order of each one of these units is 5 volts, by the way. So we're going 5 volts, and these are 1 volt increments. So 5, 10, that would be 15 volts right there on this wave. So we're at, what did I say, 14.4, right about what you would expect here. So this is a very nice, clean DCC wave 4. So now what I want to do is take you to the next oscilloscope scan and take a look at that one. Okay, so this second scan I'm showing you, it was the same DCC system, the same NCE uh, Powerhouse Pro. In this case, though, the probe's contacts to the uh, oscilloscope have been moved to the end of a 30-foot DCC power bus. And what you can see here, we're now looking at 10-volt increments for these major divisions. So each one of these individual divisions here is 2 volts each. And what, what you can look at first are these spikes here. See this? We've got our square wave, and then we've got this spike here. We've got another spike here, another one here. They're slightly different. But you look at the other rail, and they're much smaller. And these power spikes here are something that are not good. Because if you look at this, peak to peak, from this peak to this peak, we're at 58.8 volts. That's pretty significant. Now, that works out to something like 10, 20, 30, almost 40 volts on this peak at this point. Now, keep in mind that decoders typically are designed to take something like 22, 23 volts, something in that realm. So you can see why a peak reaching up to 40 volts is not going to be healthy for your decoder. And these are the, these peaks, by the way, are taken on an unloaded system. That means that there are no uh, locomotives running on the track, no extraneous noise from motor brushes or anything like that. So this is a fairly clean system right here. So these are basically then uh, due to interactions between this alternating DCC power signal and the wires themselves, because that's all that's involved. These could be very damaging when you've got a track loaded with locomotives and a lot more amperage flowing through these wires. Because at this point, it's nothing's going on, and all you're, you're basically just measuring the basic DCC signal. Now, of course, most of you don't have access to a Tektronics oscilloscope and the ability to make these kind of measurements. So you need some way of knowing just how do you know when you have problems potentially on your rails. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. Now there are actually three things that determine how likely you are to face these problems. And the first one is the size of your model railroad. And as Mark Gurish likes to point out, the NMRA testing regime for DCC is based on the typical four by eight foot model railroad. And if you're operating a 4 by 8 foot model railroad and not having any problems, that's why, because DCC is made to operate first on a 4 by 8 foot layout. So if you've got runs that are, say, 30 feet long uh, on your uh, power buses, that can create problems. If you're dealing with a shorter uh, area, a shorter length of, of wire, it's less of an issue, probably. Another factor is the amperage. As long as you're dealing with uh, boosters that are 5 amps and under, you're probably not going to have any issues, unless you've got 40, 50 foot long power bus runs. And then that becomes the main factor. And if you've got boosters on your layout that are 6 or 8 or 
10 amps or anything like that, then you can start to expect to have worse problems because these voltage spikes and other issues are proportional to the potential energy in the wires. And that again is proportional to the number of amps that are flowing through those wires. So basically then, if you have a model railroad and you're wondering how you can go about fixing the issue up front as you're building it, there's a couple of things you can do to deal with it. If you're going to have runs that are longer than 30 feet of your uh, signal bus or your DCC bus wires, or if you're going to be using boosters that are more than five amps uh, in power, then you need to start considering ways that you can deal with that in advance. And one way that is highly recommended by both NCE and Digitrax is twisting your bus wires. And that means twisting them literally around themselves uh, two to three times per foot. And Mark describes in his website how to go about doing that twisting. Now, as I have told you in the past and in other videos, I use something called zip cord. Now this is 14 gauge uh, audio cable. And it's, it's called a zip cord because it's got two conductors here that are 14 gauge and attached in the center by a thin strip of plastic or vinyl. And you can just peel these apart and it makes it easy to work with it. But because these are so close together, uh, it helps to remove a lot of these inductance related problems uh, and get rid of electromagnetic interference that might cause problems with your DCC signal. And the way that twisting or zip cord works is by getting these two wires as close together as they can possibly be, it helps to eliminate uh, the issues related to inductance and electromagnetic interference and a number of other factors and gives you a much cleaner waveform in the end. And the reason uh, I got onto this was I was talking with Larry Meyer of DCC Specialties one time and he told me he did an experiment. He took a hundred foot spool of this stuff and he tested it. He connected one end to an NCE command station and then hooked up his oscilloscope to the other end of that 100 foot of wire. And what he found out was that the DCC signal at the end of the 100 foot looked identical to the way it did when it first came out of the command station. So it cleaned it up completely. And so he found this to be just as good as twisting. And it's a heck of a lot easier than trying to twist 30, 40, 50, 100 foot of wire, let me tell you. But what do you do if you've got a model railroad and you've run into these set of symptoms that I just laid out for you? How can you fix that? Jim Scores at NCE felt strongly enough about people using these that he designed uh, one that you can buy. They come in a two pack for around $12.95. And let me show you uh, down here on the workbench just what we're talking about. Okay, so first things first, what is an RC filter made of? Well, an RC filter comprises two things. There is a 0.1 microfarad 50 volt capacitor. And for HO layouts, you're gonna want a resistor here rated at 100 ohms and one half of a watt. Now for larger scales, uh, above HO, you want to move up to a full one watt resistor. And that's all they are. Two components, very easy. All you do is solder them together. And then these get connected across your signal bus. So if you got two wires, this would be attached to your signal bus or to your DCC power bus at the very end. So if you got a 30 or 40 foot long power bus, you would just connect this device at the ends of that wiring bus. And you would do that for every wiring bus on your model railroad. Now, can you use more than one? Yes, you can use more than one. If you find that you've got a long bus and it's got a lot of noise, say in the middle, and you find you're uh, having runaways or your trains are, uh, uh, you're losing control of your locomotives halfway around, something like that, then you might put another one of these in there because they don't use up a lot of power. Somewhere between a quarter and a third of a watt is all that they use. So it's a very small amount of power that they do consume. So you can put several of these on your layout without any concern. You can order these, I get these, and I'll put these part numbers uh, that I got from 
uh, all electronics. And again, all it is is a 100 ohm resistor, one half watt for HO and N scale, and one watt, full one watt for uh, O scale and above. And here we have our capacitors. They're a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, 50 volt DC. And that 50 volt DC value is important because you'll want it to, you don't want to blow it uh, with a 30 volt or 40 or so volt uh, uh, power surge on your track. So they will work up to 50 volts. They're very easy to install, very easy to make. Obviously, you've only got two components to solder together. But what if you don't want to do that? Well, as I said, the folks at, in, at NCE, Jim Scores, designed this uh, RC filter for you. And they come uh, in a two-pack for $12.95 for the pair. And basically all they are is they have the little capacitor built in right here and then they've got five resistors in parallel and they will give you 94 ohms. That's close enough to 100 where it does the same job. And then it's got a little screw terminal set up here and you just hook the two wires uh, at the end of your DCC power bus. They go right into the screw terminals here. You screw them down tight and you're done. That's all there are to it. No soldering required at all. And that will take care of it for you. Okay? So you've got your choice. You can lay out your $12.95 and buy the uh, uh, RC filters from NCE, or you can build your own using the individual components shown here. And again, if you're interested in the part numbers, I will put them in, my, uh, in the description to the video. So take a look at that. Uh, I can't think of anything else to tell you about the use of these. They're very easy to use, very straightforward. But remember, these are only a Band-Aid that you can use to fix problems once they start to occur. If you find that you've built your model railroad and you experience the symptoms that I laid out for you earlier, then you can go back and add these as a Band-Aid to try to fix the issue. And it's very cheap to a uh, very cheap band-aid in this case to go about using. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. I hope you learned a little something about RC filters and what they fix, how you can use them on your model railroad, and the kind of things that you need to look out for uh, when you're operating your trains to know whether or not you need an RC filter. So take it easy, have a great week, and we'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC guy. Bye now.